yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, how Lindsay's Bible study, the book of John. Now remember, in the first message on this series, I showed that the Gospel of John was written after John was on Patmos and wrote the book of Revelation. The Gospel of John is the last book of the Bible, last book of the New Testament to be written. And so I want you to think about tonight why John writes about Jesus in this lofty, beautiful, in-depth sense that he does, but none of the other gospel writers did. You couldn't go through what John describes his experience here in the book of Revelation and write something uh, normal about him. So let's just look at this for a second. In verse 1, Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants. Now, the word revelation, apocalypto, which we get the word apocalypse. And frankly, most people call revelation the apocalypse. That means the unveiling. Revelation means the unveiling. And in the first words, John says, this is the unveiling of Jesus. Now, this doesn't, doesn't just mean the unveiling of predictions that come out, but the unve unveiling of he himself, the true nature of Jesus is unveiled in the book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, John was probably the closest human being to Jesus of anyone. He had time to reflect over and over again on every experience that he had while walking with Jesus here on earth. And then he had this incredible experience of Jesus appearing to him on the Isle of Patmos. Jesus speaks to John in verse 8. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And then John describes, I am his purpose. I am John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and the perseverance which are in Jesus and was on the island of called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And he describes those. And then he says, verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his breast with golden girdle. That's the, that is the uh, uniform of a priest. And his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like the burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in the furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his hand on upon me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. All right. Now, 
John, who, humanly speaking, was the closest person to Jesus, even he was so overwhelmed by the appearance of Jesus to him that he fell as a dead man. And it was only when Jesus put his hand on him and said, don't be afraid that he could rise up again. Now, if you had an experience like that, it would make you rethink everything that you had experienced with him while he was on earth, wouldn't it? You see, it was relating that to the church of Ephesus, which is where he was brought back after he was released from Patmos when Domitian, uh, Caesar Domitian died. That's why the church of Ephesus urged him to write an account of the life of Jesus that would give this deeper insight into the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is a real pants presser here. This is my first Greek New Testament. I signed it 1956. Now, I'm going to read the Greek with the inflection of the ancient Greek. In, in Greek today, they make no distinction between a long E and a short E, or a long O and a short O, Omicron and Omega, both O's. But Omicron was short, Omega was long. They don't make distinctions like that today in modern Greek. They've kind of bastardized it. And do you know there's six letters in the modern Greek today that they just pronounce E? But in ancient Greek, and this is why they were such great orators, they could, they could speak nuances of thought by the distinction of, for instance, the, uh, long E, which looks like an H with a long tail on it, A, versus Epsilon, E. And, uh, all of that is brought out in this first text. Now, I want to remind you of something else, too. That if you're just beginning Greek, just beginning to learn it, the best place is to start in John chapter 1, verse 1. Because it's the simplest Greek imaginable. I mean, uh, a, a young child, first learning Greek, would be able to read this. That's why only the Holy Spirit could have written this through John. Because he takes the language of little children and, and uh, he teaches the deepest thoughts that our minds can ever grapple. So here is the first verse. In Arche, and ologos, kai ologos and proston veon, kai theos and ologos, utos en an arche, proston theo. First two verses. Now these, I'm going to take paragraph by paragraph, because this is a beginning of. Uh, a view of Jesus Christ that is heavenly higher than anything else written. You know, it's, uh, it's traditional for all philosophers when they begin, a, a great philosopher begins a, uh, philosophy of his own philosophy of, of the world view and life and so forth. They, they will always try to go back to the most irreducible beginning or thought or the most absolute concept that they can start it and lay a foundation on which they will then go on to present their philo philosophical worldview. And one of the greatest human thinkers as a philosopher was Aristotle. Aristotle began his philosophy by saying, there is an unmoved mover. He 
You see, he didn't know there were gods of every kind in the Greek culture. But he said there was something else. There was, uh, in, in this panoply of gods, there was one that was the unmoved mover of everything. And so that was his profound beginning. And then you have many other philosophers who started out with their foundation until it degenerated into the 18th century where men had gone far away from philosophy of the past that assumed that there must be a god. Because then uh, Descartes started out with a Cartesian principle, as it's called, I think, therefore I exist. He started with himself. See, See how human thought degenerated. Well, John starts out, here's an uneducated fisherman. Greek is his second language, third language probably because he spoke Aramaic and Hebrew as well. But uh, he begins in the language of children, his philosophy of life, and it is the most profound thoughts ever uttered. First, look at your English, the first paragraph. In the beginning was the word. Okay, there. this is something you have to learn, and I think if you bought that very helpful book by Tenney, John the Gospel of Belief, in the introduction he brought out the fact that Greek is a language that you can uh, never translate in a close uh, verbal translation because some of the words require uh, a long explanation. It's just not something that you can write in brief, in brevity. So that is true, and here's why I want to take this clause point by point. First of all, like it says in the English, in the beginning was the word. There is no definite article in the original before the word archaic. Okay. Are beginning. Now, whenever the Greeks left a definite article out, it was never to be translated a beginning. The fact that it's not a definite beginning, and it draws attention to the beginning, the word beginning itself, means you are to Think way back now. In beginning. Which beginning? Whatever beginning you can conceive. In other words, this is designed to take your mind back to the, to the most distant past that you can conceive. To the most foundational beginning that you can conceive. And in, the preposition in is in the locative of sphere, which means once you think back to that beginning, you're locked there. Your thought is to lock there. Okay, are you following me? Okay. Now all of these are rules of Greek grammar. Well, I can think back to the time when there was no material universe. I can conceive back to the time that there was space. That's as far back as I can go in my thing. All right, whatever is your point of thinking, then comes the next part of this clause. It's the simple little verb, eta nun. Ain is the way it's pronounced. Now, that is the third person singular, imperfect, active indicative <laughs> of I, me, which is the word for being. All right. Now, this word for being is inherently something that continues, isn't it? Being means something 
that is existing, okay? But he puts that verb for being into the imperfect tense in the Greek, which means, and it always means this, continuous action in past time. All right, now link that to the first part of this clause. In beginning, all right, you've already thought back to the farthest point you can conceive. All right, there's where you lock. And then the verb, continuous action in past time, starts from there. And so what it is saying is simply this. In beginning, the farthest point back that you can conceive they are continuously existed. In other words, before any beginning you can conceive, they're continuously existed. Halogos, the word. Now, is there any way of saying, are you all following me? Is there any way of saying more emphatically that this person called the Word never had a beginning. That's what it means. Any beginning you can conceive, he was continuously existing before. And then he brings in this concept, and it's an incredible concept, hologos. Definite article, ha, logos, the word. The makes him unique. Now, there are several words in Greek for word. Rhema, for instance, means the spoken word. Logos, however, looks and emphasizes the thought behind the word. It's, it's about the word, but it's the thought behind it, too. Now, you have to realize that this title, it's a title for the second person of the, of the Godhead and Jesus. Okay? It's a title. Now, why does God call him the word? Suppose that I had to communicate with you tonight, but I couldn't use words. Wouldn't get across much, would I? But I can use words. And what are words? You look and you see me. To some grotesque, however, but you see me, but you don't see the real me, do you? The real me is inside this body. The real me is invisible. And the way I unveil who I am is through my words. You follow? That's why this beautiful title is given to Jesus. Because, you see, he is the second person of the Godhead. I'll show you why I say that in a minute. And however the triune God reveals himself, it's always through the second person, whether it's an action, a, a visible appearance, a voice, or whatever. The only visible, knowable expression of God always comes through the second person. And that's why it's called the Word, because he reveals the invisible God. Whatever 
can be known outside of the Godhead is always revealed through the second person. Follow me? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that profound? I mean, these are the words of children, and yet they go beyond any philosophy man could ever create. All right, so the first clause tells us the eternal existence of the second person. So that's that's the intent, the eternal existence of the second person. All right, let's go to the second clause. Kaya ologos and proston theon. All right. In English it says, and the word was with God. Once again, no way that you, I mean, it's an accurate translation as far as it goes, but there's no way to get what the Greek is saying in a few words. Now, remember, it says chi, which means and or even. In this case, it means and. And it says and. The word, title, ain, it's the same word, the verb for being in the imperfect tense. It's used all the way through here. Ain, the imperfect tense for being. Pros, now there is a new word, pros, it's a preposition. But it means a lot more than with. Whenever, in Greek, pros is used to relate two people together. It doesn't just mean they are with each other. Pros means, there are other words, by the way, that the other prepositions that can be used to say with. Pros means face to face with. So this is saying, the, and the word always was face to face with God. So what does that tell us? For, for uh, there to be face-to-face -face relationship, what does that demand? That there's more than one person. So this shows the distinct personality of the second person called the word. Follow? So this person called the word always was eternally face to face with God the Father, first person. So he's always in this intimate face to face relationship with him. So that gives us again the distinct personality of the second person. All right, now let's go to the third clause. Kai, kai theos, ein, there's that imperfect tense again. Kai theos, ein, ologos. And as it says in the English, and the word was God. All right, theos is the word for God. And kai theos ein hologos. Now, it's important to note that the order of words, the syntax of Greek, puts the most important thought at the beginning of a sentence because they have inflection in the uh, declension in the nouns and uh, pronouns and uh, adjectives and so forth. They can put it anywhere in the sentence and you can know where it goes, what it modifies. Uh, but here is the important thing. There is no definite article before God. 
Now, if you've ever been <laughs> confronted by the Jehovah Witnesses at your door, they always try to say, it doesn't say the God, it says a God. And the word was a God. And then they'll come on, he's the son of God. So if he's the son of God, he had to have a beginning, he had to be born, etc., etc. Well, <laughs> they can add on to all of their heresy. But one thing for sure, they do not know Greek. Remember, absence of the definite article draws attention to the essential essence and meaning of the noun that the article is left out. Okay. So here, the way this should be understood is, and the word, as to his essence, always was God. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you become God's possession. You are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it, you can't buy it, and you can't lose it. Because if you could, you would. <laughs> As I prepared for this week's program, I was again struck by the speed with which events are moving into the scenario the prophets predicted for the end times. I believe we're there. People on the street are talking about what all of these things mean. Folks that wouldn't darken the door of a church or pick up a, a Bible are now very curious. This may be our greatest opportunity, maybe even our last opportunity, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ before we're silenced by political correctness. The message that God has given me is more important now than it's ever been for the church and for the nation. That's why I'm asking you to help me to expand our reach. You can find more of Hal Lindsey at his website, www.howlindsey.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey CDs, books, and other specialty items. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470470, Tulsa, Oklahoma. 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1 888 Rapture.